Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa rahmatika wa rahmatika wa rahmatika wa I would like to welcome each and every one of you to this beautiful event. One of the uh, beauty of our tradition is the concept of getting together. And this is really um, the suhba and companionship is at the foundation of our teachings. And tonight we are blessed to be amongst the people who have spent a lifetime searching for people to be in their company. And this is really one of the uh, great scholars, uh, Azizuddin Nasafi, um, not Azizuddin, Azizuddin Nasafi in a book called Insan al Kamil. He wrote that all of your studies, everything that you learn in your life, all of the struggles that you go through, everything that you put, all of the effort um, in your entire life is for one purpose and one purpose only, in order to qualify for the meeting. All of that is for the suhba, the companionship. Your knowledge, your studies, your struggle will take you to that moment of companionship because that is the moment that turns zinc into gold, being with people of God. And our uh, two distinguished speakers and presenters tonight, both of them, have traveled their entire life in order to be in the companionship of those who turn gold from the dirt. And this is the nature of saints. This is the nature of insan al Kamil. This is the nature of beautiful people that they will turn you, they will change. And this is called the, this is why uh, Sidi Harun's book, uh, uh, The Turning of the Hearts. This is a moment that you turn your heart. And once to turn hearts, this is one of the most beautiful ahadith. All of the uh, ahadith are beautiful. But when the Sahabas, they went to the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they said, um, Um Salama, and they said, what was the dua that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made most in sajda? And she said, the dua that he made most in sajda was, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O oh, the turner of the hearts, make my heart firm on your deen. And Allah is a turner of the hearts. And, and this is why these books and these journeys are important because these, this is all about the people who turn their hearts, turn their hearts towards a loving God, Al-Wudud, turn their hearts toward the Tawab, the God that accepts their Toba. And this is the concept of Toba in Islam is a turning of the hearts. And the Abdullah Ansari, the great Mufassir of the fifth century said, when you turn your heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, also have a smile on your face because you're turning towards a loving God. The smile and turns toward Allah and that's the, the, the greatest of Toba. And this is uh, our uh, first speaker before we introduce him. <clears throat> I wanted to say that um, we wanted to thank Zaytuna College for putting this event, the Zaytuna College Bookstore and Khala Khadija who always beautify events, and you can see the beauty of, of her work in, in, the, in, the, in the bookstore and in the uh, reception room. We also want to thank uh, Sidi Athar and the Mecca Books, who have been doing khidmah for this deen, for the Muslim community in North America. May Allah protect them and increase them and give them tawfiq and all that they do for putting this tour together and bringing uh, Sidi Peter Sanders, who I've been trying to bring in for 16 years, and they have been saying no. I don't know how we got him to come. Uh, so I'm a little bit hurt, but anyways, that's uh, <laughs> another story. Uh, he promised, he said, well, he's gonna come back next year. So we'll see. Maybe another 16 years, I don't think I'm gonna be here on this planet Earth. Please don't do that again. So, uh, alhamdulillah. But um, um, we will have, um, the schedule was just sent to me, and um, I will go over the schedule to make sure everybody, so we'll have, inshallah, the speakers, uh, there's going to be talks uh, at the beginning uh, by uh, Sidi Harun uh, and then uh, Sidi Peter Sanders will give a talk and then we'll have a Q&A after the talks and then after that there'll be book signing so uh, inshallah they will sign your books and I've seen uh, Sidi Peter because I got the copy of my book in Wales about a month ago uh, we were there together and uh, uh, the presentation I can look at it five more times and I still won't get bored because it's so beautiful uh, it, it's, it's a living history of the spirituality uh, in our lives. And also it's for me, when I listen to his, if you just listen and just look at destiny, 
If you want to know how destiny works, just listen. And you would see how it drives everything is in the hands of God and it takes you through this ocean of called the oceans of life. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, Sidi Harun, who uh, uh, I don't know how to introduce this man. I've been, uh, it's been about 25 years I've been wanting to meet him. And uh, finally I got to know him, see him tonight. Uh, uh, we are here because Zaytuna College, this is the first building that was purchased by Zaytuna College. If you remember an academic address in America, this is it. You are in the academic address in America. Before that, we didn't have it. And Sheikh Hamza Hafizullah with the uh, Imam Zaid Shakir and Dr. Hatim Bazian, may Allah protect them, they are uh, the co-founders of this, of this uh, institution. Um, they purchased this with the help of the community, the people who are here, and the people from across the world. Um, this per building was purchased, so we are here. Um, this is the man, uh, imagine being there when Sheikh Hamza took his shahada. Just imagine that. When this 17 year old young man walked in and he said, I want to become Muslim. Well, he was there. And uh, I don't want to give more out. Read the book, Signs on the Horizon, and the story of the 300. And so it's, it's in there. Um, beautiful story to see uh, what came out. This is why people, there are people who are one, but there are people who are 10. Uh, Mawlana Rumi said there are people who are thousands. Um, uh, one person. But one thing that I love about this, uh, the, uh, his books is the, the concept of Toba is at the center of, of the teachings of these books, uh, the turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's time that we need to put that really back in the teachings, especially to our, te to our students and our children who are young, because without Toba, people go into hopelessness. And Toba is so beautiful that the Quran says, Wallahu yatubu alaykum. Uh, that Allah, he, he turns towards his, his servant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to turn towards his, the desire of God that he wants to turn. Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. He wants to turn, but the, the people of the, the companionship, this is why these books are important because companionship is at the end of the, 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 the story of our life is who you hang with. The companionship, the Quran says uh, that those people But those who, you know, they follow their desires, they want you to deviate, go against God, go the opposite direction. Allah wants you to go towards you, turns towards you, but they are saying the people of them, no, 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 it turns back. And this is where Mawlana Rumi has a beautiful line who says to teach us that you either turn to God in this world or God will make you turn to him in the hereafter. You don't have a choice. It's one of the two. And he said, Agar bakhashim ravi sat hazar sal zaman ba aqibat wa manayi ke muntahat manam. It's a munajat. It says, oh my servant, and if you distance yourself away from me for a thousand years, you will come back to me because I am the end of your affairs. So we should turn to God in this world before we're humiliated and turns toward him in the hereafter. And this is what I, what I love about these books because at the core teaching of, of, of uh, Sidi Harun's uh, uh, Sugij is, is, uh, is the concept of turning to Allah in Toba and in, in, in being in, in the presence of the people of righteousness. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to invite him to the mic, inshallah, to do his presentation. Bismillah. This book is about tawbah, about repentance. So I'll begin with an introductory passage. Abdullah Ansari of Herat wrote, know that knowledge is life, wisdom is a mirror, contentment a protective wall, hope a mediator and intercessor, Rep remembrance of God a remedy, and repentance a cure. Repentance is the signpost on the path, the leader of the kingdom, the key to the treasure, the intermediary that assists you to become united with God, the condition for being accepted to the divine presence, and the secret of all happiness. We are living in dark, uncertain times, full of distraction, 
turmoil and violence that are either upon us or impending. We see this turmoil every day on television, in movies, in the headlines, online. We cannot escape it. And as Muslims, we're drifting as if in a riptide, away out into an open notional sea of uncertainty, far from the heart of our belief. I've watched this trend, sometimes in the midst of it, but mostly from the sidelines, and I've seen its impact on the hearts of believers. This book is a small attempt to ameliorate this insidious drift. Since Signs on the Horizons was first published, I've made several book tours that have put me in direct contact with many wonderful Muslims with beautiful hearts and the best of intentions, and they fill me with hope. Yet, I've been astonished by a deep and prevailing insecurity and lack of confidence I hear from many. The influence of a stark and rigid and frankly heretical form of Islam which focuses on externalities and equates sin with unbelief has had a pervasive and dispiriting influence on the hearts and minds of Muslims around the world, whether they subscribe to these doctrines or not. At the same time, many have been raised with a distorted understanding of their faith or no understanding at all. I've spoken to many young people, particularly young Muslims who were born into the faith, who have quite naturally fallen prey to many of the temptations of modern life or, have, or who have learned an ethnocentric interpretation of Islam that takes no account of the time and place we live in. For those who enter Islam from another faith or from no faith at all, exposure to a dysfunctional mainstream can have an unsettling impact on their new faith and practice and propel them to deviant versions of Islam that provide simplistic answers to subtle questions. Today, young Muslims read books about the perfection of the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, his family, and companions, and the ancient saints of Islam, the Awaleen, may God be well pleased with them all, and feel by comparison doomed to perdition, or at best inadequate to the spiritual path of Ihsan that forms the very heart of our faith. Most young people have lost touch with traditional teaching. They pick up where their parents left off, for better or for worse, or they're stuck with very and sometimes grotesquely imperfect teaching. They feel weak and unworthy, as if they've stepped beyond the pale. Somehow in the process they've lost sight of, or never understood, the fact that the purification of the heart is a process of continuous turning. In English, repentance is a forbidding word that suggests a puritanical finality, but in Arabic, the term tawbah is dynamic, meaning to turn or to return. At tawab is one of the names of God, the oft returning. It is an active constant, an ongoing reality that renews every moment we are alive. The Saint Sahal ibn Abdullah al Tustari, may God be well pleased with him, wrote, Tawbah is a duty incumbent upon a human being every moment, whether of the elect or common folk, whether obedient to God or disobedient. Tawbah is therefore our default setting. Everyone sins, everyone, even saints. But the sins of a saint are of a different order. For an ordinary mortal, a sin is usually gross, for a saint, forgetting God for a single instant is a sin requiring a return to God. When someone asked Dulnun al-Misr, may God be well pleased with him, about repentance, he answered that the common people repent from sins, whereas the elect repent from forgetfulness. This book is a declaration of mercy and certainty formed of a collection of stories I've experienced, read, or heard. It is about how malleable the human heart can be and how wrongdoing, remorse, need, and yearning intersect with divine compassion, forgiveness, and guidance. 
It is also about the sudden transitions from confusion to clarity, from sin to virtue, from sleep to wakefulness, from ignorance to knowledge, from foolishness to wisdom. And finally, it is about the path of our lives, which leads us gradually, and for those whom God favors, inexorably to salvation. And Sidi Muhammad ibn al-Habib wrote, Though my sins may surely weigh heavy upon me, still I trust in your goodness to mend my brokenness. Favor us, O most forgiving Lord, with repentance that effaces the mistakes which were made in times past, and increase us in blessings and light and unveilings, and enable us to guide with permission and the secret. Support us in what we say and do, and make easy our provision from a place we do not know. Here we stand at the door of benevolence, awaiting without hardship the kindness of the friend. So the book is in seven parts. The first part is called God Finds You Wherever You Are, and it concerns people who've done some very terrible things. They've been criminals and, uh, and uh, de sort of depraved individuals, and how they've w turned their lives around and changed and come into Islam or started practicing again. The second section is called Turning Points, which is about changes people have made that have taken them to a deeper understanding of their own belief or to an introduction uh, to Islam and an entry into a new faith. The third part is migrations, which concerns stories of people who've actually gone from one place to another in a search for the, the truth and, and for their own uh, salvation. The fourth is, is uh, called Openings, and it concerns stories about people who've had deep um, spiritual experiences or dreams that have led them to, um, to uh, knowledge and, and to guidance. <clears throat> the sixth part is, is, is about myself. It's called A Series of Fortunate Events, and it's my own story, um, and I may read something from that just um, as a self-indulgence, I guess. And uh, the seventh section is called The Beginning of the End, and it's a kind of a wrap-up. And what I'd like to do is actually start at the end of the book um, this time. I haven't ever done this before. <clears throat> when the believer reaches 50 years of age, God lightens his accounts when he reaches 60. Uh, sorry, when, when the believer reaches 50 years of age, God lightens his account. When he reaches 60, God grants him penitence, or inaba. When he reaches 70, he is loved by the inhabitants of the heavens. When he reaches 80, righteous deeds are recorded for him, and God pardons his misdeeds. When he reaches 90, his sins are forgiven. He is allowed to intercede for his household, and he is God's prisoner on earth. And when he reaches 100 and is an, unable to perform righteous works, he will, have, he will have written for him all of the righteous works he used to perform during his period of health and youth. And this is from the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu The later, the better. In recent times, a sincere young novice implored his spiritual master to take him to the station of Ma'arifa, or direct knowledge of God. His, sh his sheikh said, don't ask for this. But the young disciple was insistent. I beg you to take me to the goal. The sheikh repeated, don't ask for this. But the disciple persisted, demanding that his master take him on the path toward fana fila, or effacement in God, right then and there. So the sheikh replied, all right, if this is what you really want, go now to your wife and divorce her, settle your affairs, say goodbye to your children, and then come to me. The young disciple was stunned. I, I, uh, I, I can't do that, he said. His master said, then don't ask for this. 
We have become impatient. We want quick results, instant coffee, fast food, speed dating, speed reading, overnight success, accelerated learning, enlightenment weekends, instant nirvana. We celebrate youth and mourn old age. To be sure, old age is to be mourned if we have wasted our time in this world and have nothing to show for the next. That youth is wasted on the young is, alas, mostly the case, but not always as evidenced by the sincere young novice. Nevertheless, the search for knowledge is a continuum, a long haul. We have no other way of knowing God except through ourselves. This requires continuous repentance and constant purification of the heart. This takes time. This takes a lifetime. There are exceptions, of course, but the idea that we should expect to be catapulted to great spiritual heights in record time is delusional. When I was young and impatient, my Sheikh Sayyid Omar Abdullah, Muini Baraka, used to quote his Sheikh, Habib Omar bin Sumayt, may God be well pleased with them both, who said, the later the better. What they meant by this was that it is better to receive spiritual knowledge later in life when one has reached maturity and attained a measure of wisdom and balance rather than to receive spiritual gifts prematurely before one is prepared to handle them. The wisdom of our great sages in this time dictates a slow and gradual path. I once asked Sayyid Omar why it was important to know about exalted spiritual stations such as Fanafila, which is effacement in God, and Baqabila, which is subsistence in God, when we were so far from them. And he replied that God is so generous that he gives his servants everything they desire before they die, even if it be minutes before death. Persistence and patience is a common admonition from spiritual adepts to novices. A friend of mine once asked the Moroccan saint, Sidi Muhammad Sahrawi, what to do if one performs invocation, dhikrullah, and it never reaches the heart. Sidi Muhammad replied that he should persist in invocations. Sometimes, he said, the invocation doesn't reach the heart until moments before you die. An old man came to Abu Sh uh, Ali Shaqiq Ibrahim al-Azdi and said to him, O oh, Shaykh, I have sinned much and now I wish to repent. Shaqiq said, you have come late. The old man answered, no, I have come soon. Whoever comes before he is dead comes soon, though he may have been long in coming. The medieval Egyptian saint Dulnun al-Misr had an incredibly devout disciple. This man had entered into a 40-day spiritual retreat 40 times. He had made the pilgrimage 40 times, and for 40 years he had stood the entire night in prayer and observed the supererogatory fa fasts. For 40 long years, he watched over the chamber of his heart, and yet after all that, he came to Dhulnun in desperation. After recounting his sincere exertions, he said, I have done all this, and for all my effort, self-denial, and sacrifice, the friend has not spoken one word to me, nor has he favored me with a single glance. He takes no account of me and reveals nothing to me from the unseen world. I am not saying this to praise myself, nor to complain against God. I am simply stating the facts. I have done everything in my power to devote my heart and soul to his service. I am not saying this because my heart has grown weary of obedience. I am only relating my sad misfortune. For my entire life, I have knocked on the door in hope. But after all this time, there has been no answer and the silence has become unbearable. My fear is that if further life remains ahead of me, everything will remain the same. You are the physician of the afflicted and the sovereign prescriber of the sages. Please give me a cure for my sorrow. Thulnun replied, perhaps if the friend will not show himself to you with kindness 
and gentleness, he'll reveal himself with reproach. So tonight, eat a big meal and go to sleep without performing any superogratory prayers. Don't rise in the night, but stay asleep until at morning. If he will not look upon you with compassion, then perhaps he will look upon you with severity. The disciple left the company of his sheikh and returned to his home. He reluctantly ate his fill, but couldn't bring himself to omit his prayers. He lay down, closed his eyes, and fell into a deep sleep. In his sleep, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, appeared to the troubled worshiper. Your friend greets you, he says. An effeminate, unmadly wretch is he who comes to my court and is quickly satisfied. The root of the matter is a lifetime of righteousness without complaint. God the Exalted says to you, I have given your heart its desire for 40 years, and I fulfill your desire, and I grant you the attainment of all you hope for, but convey my greetings to that bandit and pretender Dhul Noon. Say to him, pretender and liar, if I do not expose your shame before all in the city, then I am not your Lord. See that you never again seduce the lovers away from my court. The disciple awoke, overcome with weeping. He rushed to Dhul Noon and related his dream. When Dhul Noon heard the words God spoke through his messenger denouncing him, he wept for joy, fell down, and rolled on the ground in ecstasy. No sincere effort for the sake of God is ever wasted. The reward can be hidden for a lifetime, but have no doubt it will come to you. Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi said that the way of Jesus was the way of purifying the soul by withdrawing from the world into solitude, while the way of Muhammad was the way of purifying the soul with the world. There is no monasticism in Islam. By engaging with the world according to the revealed law, the Sharia, the heart can be purified over time. One of the 19th century masters from the Moroccan desert placed his disciples under fierce discipline. They lived lives of intense austerity and asceticism, enduring sleeplessness, hunger, continuous worship, and perpetual remembrance of God. There were those from the nearby village who esteemed the people of the way, sometimes joined their circles of dhikrullah and gave gifts of food and money to support these men of God. These pious citizens were known as muhibbin, those who had not taken an initiation of commitment to the spiritual path, but who loved and respected those who did. One from among them was a local shopkeeper who only had a casual association with the sheikh and his disciples. When he became old, he retired, gave up his shop, approached the sheikh, and asked to be initiated. The sheikh received the shopkeeper into the order and immediately put him into a khalwa, or a spiritual retreat. After one day, the shopkeeper experienced fanafila and reached the goal of ma'arifa. In astonishment and frustration, the sheikh's disciples protested. We've been on this path for 20 years, enduring great privation and hardship for the sake of God, and yet none of us has experienced fanafila. How is it that this ordinary shopkeeper, who has done nothing all these years other than to observe his obligatory religious and worldly duties, has reached this exalted station so quickly while we are deprived of ma'arifa, the sheikh replied, he was dry wood. All I had to do was strike a spark, and he was consumed. You're all still green and wet. You have yet to dry out. Ibn al Iskandari wrote, if you do not believe that God can take you at this moment and make you one of his friends, his awliya, then you are ignorant of his power. My mother was born in 1920 in Grand Junction, Colorado. She was a small town girl, a country girl, really. She grew up in a more innocent time during the Great Depression. She went off to university in California and graduated with a teaching credential. 
She married the beginning of the Second World War and adopted me in 1949 when I was three months old. She wasn't my biological mother, but in every other sense, she was my real mother. She instilled in me an interest in reading and learning. She was curious and open-minded, but was perplexed when I entered Islam. For her, it was a jarring turn of events, me dropping out of what might have been a successful career and joining this utterly strange religion. Was I becoming a religious fanatic? Was it a cult? It certainly wasn't something she could relate with parental pride to her friends and family. She didn't like it at all. It wasn't normal. We became estranged for a few years. It was only after I got married that our relationship improved. My mother fell in love with my wife and then head over heels in love with our daughter when she was born in her home. I never spoke to my mother about Islam. She never really asked me questions. She may have spoken to my wife, I don't know. When we moved to Saudi Arabia, we kept in touch by phone. One day, out of the blue, my mother said, I think I should become a Muslim. I believe in it. That was all. She mentioned that she had read Islam and the Destiny of Man by my friend Gay Eaton, and this convinced her. I can't remember whether I recommended the book to her or whether she discovered it on her own. I was stunned and delighted. We made arrangements for her to come to Saudi Arabia and stay with us in Mecca. Apart from some European tourism after she was widowed, my mother had never ventured into such alien territory. Here she was at the very heart of Islam. I introduced her to my sheikh, Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad. May God be well pleased with him. I simply wanted her to sit in his presence for a few minutes. Habib instructed me to personally push my mother in a wheelchair in the Sa'i between Safa and Marwa during the Umrah. When she left the room, he shook his head and said to me, Miskina, poor woman, she has waswas, which is whispering. This was true. In old age, inner chatter increasingly overwhelmed her. We made the Umrah, and I had the blessing of pushing her in her wheelchair in, uh, in the Sa'i. We made Ziara to al Madina. My mother marveled at the Ottoman vestiges in the Prophet's mosque. She stayed with us for one month. We wanted her to stay longer, but she felt homesick and returned to California. I advised her to keep her Islam pri a private matter so as not to alienate her from her close friends who she was greatly attached to and were her support system. Many of her relatives lived to very advanced ages and I used to tease my mother saying, I thought she was going to be this increasingly ancient lady. She demurred, I don't want to live much longer, she said. She flew to Hawaii to visit one of her oldest friends, a college classmate. She had a wonderful time. On the flight back, she began to feel weak. She had a checkup and discovered that she had suffered from a terminal blood disease similar to leukemia. Her body could no longer produce white blood cells. She would be required to have blood transfusions in order, <clears throat> in order to survive. She related this news calmly with only a hint of surprise. With the first transfusion, she was able to carry on for about two months. My wife came from Saudi Arabia and raised her spirits, God bless her, keeping my mother continuously in stitches. She stayed for some time and then returned to Mecca to resume work. The second transfusion worked for about six weeks. The third transfusion lasted less than a month. Her time in this life was quickly diminishing. The next transfusion lasted two weeks. I flew to California in time for what was to be her final transfusion. I arrived and went directly to the hospital, arriving immediately after the transfusion. The doctor told me that this, was, this last transfusion was giving so that my mother could see me. She was transferred home by ambulance and placed under hospice care. I have never seen anyone so calm in the face of death. 
My two younger brothers, my, eld my eldest son, and I stayed by her side night and day. Her best friend, who was 12 years her senior, came by distraught. Michael, this is not supposed to happen. I should be first. I can't bear it. She outlived my mother by many years, passing away at the age of 102. I read Quran for her and recited Adhkar and Qasaid. My younger brother played the guitar and sang folk songs for her. She never complained. She was not afraid. She was ready. My mother was a good woman. She was loving and kind. She never hurt anyone. She always had a favorable opinion of God. At the back of my mind, though, I was unsure. While my mother believed in the principles of Islam, she rarely carried out any of its practices. Would that be enough? During our vigil, I was reading from the remembrance of death and the afterlife, from Imam, <clears throat> Imam al-Ghazali's The Revival of Religious Sciences. I came across this passage. It is related that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once said, watch for three signs in the dying man. If his forehead sweats, his eyes shed tears, and his lips become dry, then the mercy of God has alighted upon him. I found this last statement wondrous and strange for its extraordinary specificity. Time passed until we began to think that my mother might actually recover. She seemed to be gaining strength. I had to fly to New York. I wasn't sure what to do. I asked my brothers. They advised me to go on and return when I had finished my business. The day I left, my mother seemed to, be, to, to further revive. She ate a relatively large meal. Things seemed to be looking up. I drove down to Santa Monica to stay with friends so I could catch a flight to New York the next morning. Within minutes of my arrival, the phone rang. It was my son with the news that his grandmother had just passed. He was beside her and when she, when she took her last breath, he recited the Shahada in her ear and the Adhan. I turned around and drove back to Santa Barbara. By the time I reached home, my mother's body had been moved. I sat down with my youngest brother and asked him to tell me what happened. He knew absolutely nothing about Islam, nor had he ever had any interest in learning. When he replied, this is what he said. When she died, her forehead was wet with perspiration. There was a tear drop from the outside corner of each of her eyes, and her lips were parched and dry. A wave of relief swept over me. God is the most merciful of the merciful. We buried her as a Muslim. May God cover her in his infinite mercy, illuminate her grave, and raise her close to him on the day of rising. And may God give us the opening, union, and the salvation we seek before we die. <clears throat> and that's the end of the book. There are lots of other stories that are not so, um, I hesitate to say morbid, but Death-oriented, let's put it that way. Do we, do we, how, how much time do we have? F f five minutes? Okay. Let me see if I can find something short. Okay. I think I have something here. Okay. <clears throat> this is a short story. Many years ago, I was taken to a gathering organized at the Regent's Park Mosque in London. I tend to be gathering a verse and only came <clears throat> along because my friend was the organizer and was working hard to bring Muslims together. So we entered the foyer of the mosque, com uh, mosque complex and I was standing off to one side when someone came up, shook my hand vigorously and greeted me. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, said I. He stood there grinning. I grinned back. You don't remember me, do you, he stated. I was taken aback. I studied his face to see if I could place him. I shook my head. I'm really sorry, I said. I have a terrible memory. Well, you changed my life, he said. 
That was a conversation stopper. He then told me the story of our meeting, and as he told it, I began to remember. Years before, sometime in the mid-1970s, I had been invited by one of my best friends at the time, a Malaysian engineering student and Sufi acolyte, to come up to Norwich and stay with a group of young Malaysians studying there. The last time I had visited Norwich was in 1967 with a school madrigal ensemble I was part of. We'd given a concert in the town hall and attended a party in an ancient dungeon where, for the first time, we all heard the Beatles just released Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album. Otherwise, I knew nothing of the place until my Malaysian sojourn. When I arrived, the students insisted I visit a new British Muslim who had converted to Islam in order to marry a Malaysian woman. They were eager for me to meet the new convert, and I was happy to pay him a visit. But as soon as we turned up at his door and were invited in, I wanted to get out of there in the worst way. I know that my memory is probably playing tricks on me, but the image that came back to me that day was of a kind of lugubrious, Stanley Kowalski type, a loutish, humorless, working class bloke with empty eyes. The picture would have been complete if he had a beer in front of him. He did not. Our host seemed dull and disinterested with a quizzical look about him as if he was trying to figure out why we, what we were doing in his house. But there I was with my Malaysian friends eagerly looking to, to me to tell the new convert about Islam. So I started talking. I can't remember a word I said because all I could think about was finding a smooth and gracious exit line. I jabbered on about Islam for about 45 minutes, telling stories, moving quickly from one subject to another, looking for my cue. His wife came in to serve tea. There was something shrewish about her. He looked dazed and didn't say a word or ask a question. We drank tea. I continued with my monologue until I found the right moment to announce our departure. I shook his hand and thanked him for his hospitality. We said our farewells and made our escape. I remember that once we had descended a flight of steps, turning on my Malaysian entourage in the stairwell and scolding them. Why did you bring me here? What a waste of time, hopeless. When you came to my flat that day, he said, I never really knew anything about Islam, but I kept thinking about what you said. What you told me that day made me want to learn more about Islam, and the more I learned about Islam, the closer I came to the faith. And the closer I came to Islam, the farther apart my wife and I became. We eventually divorced, and now I am married, remarried to a pious Turkish Muslim woman. I think he told me that he owned an Islamic bookstore. Now it was my turn to be speechless and dazed. I learned a lesson that day. I learned that all guidance comes from God in whatever form he chooses and w that we are nothing more than instruments he uses in his wisdom to guide whom he wills. May God bless this sincere believer and forgive us our arrogance and delusion. There is no power and no strength but from God. And that'll be it. Uh, so Peter Sanders, I don't know how to introduce him <clears throat> because uh, I know him for, um, I think, over two decades, I would say. But one thing, uh, people ask me how old you are. I will tell you one thing about my age. I'm younger than his book. <clears throat> That's all I have to say. This book, Meeting with a Mountain, took him 50 years to put it together. And the journey that he went through is absolutely marvelous. And this for me, as I said before, is the destiny. That how God, you know, he, he writes your destiny and where he had to go. And if you can look at some of his works that he has done before, uh, uh, he uh, took his Shahada. Uh, people like the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and a lot of the, the from rock and roll, he went to the, the Moroccan role. Then he went to Morocco, ended up there. And then he went to the turning role in Turkey. And, and mashallah, and every photo, if you look at the, the uh, Zaytuna College curriculum, if you look at Purification of the Heart cover, all of, most of Sheikh Hamza's books, it's the covers are done, uh, the photos by 
C.D. Peter Sanders, and one of the people who are sitting here, our beloved sister Nabila, who started Alhambra Productions and used many of the photos from C.D. Peter, who beautified all of the CD covers that, uh, of Sheikh Hamza's uh, lectures, alhamdulillah. So uh, he's not unknown in our community. I know you haven't been here in a while, but everybody knows you here. So uh, I want you to see his journey because his journey is also a biography and his speech. So before we bring him, I want to play the videos and then he will come and do his presentation, which is, uh, mashallah, just, just, just wait and hear. Peter Sanders was one of London's leading rock and roll photographers in the 1960s, capturing images of some of the era's most iconic musicians and the cultural ferment of the hippie scene. Disillusioned by the excesses he witnessed around him, in 1971, the young photographer set off on a year-long spiritual quest that ended in Morocco. In the city of Meknes, he came face to face with one of the greatest saints of the 20th century. In a windowless room, without a flash, he captured two iconic images of Sidi Muhammad ibn al-Habib. This seminal moment set the photographer on a 45-year quest to photograph the true saints of Islam. Over nearly five decades, Peter Sanders has traveled the world seeking out these luminous, inspiring men and women, and in the course of this journey has become the Muslim world's most celebrated photographer. His acclaimed photographic books, exhibitions, and the workshops he holds around the world have earned him international awards and a global audience. Peter's astonishing odyssey has culminated in an uplifting visual record and landmark photographic book, Meetings with Mountains. Meetings with Mountains is one man's pursuit to create a photographic legacy of some of the most extraordinary people alive. He has gone all over the world looking for saints and sages to capture a moment of light. No one ever knows about these people, yet we know about saints in Hinduism and Buddhism and all the other religions, but somehow, other than Rumi, people know about Rumi. You don't find them easy. They're not celebrities. They're hidden away. They don't want anything to distract them from what they do. Their life is just praying and studying and they live in seclusion. So it's been my mission to find them and photograph them. And many of them have never been photographed before. They don't like to be photographed. As I said, not because they think it's forbidden. They don't want anything that exalts, exalts them. them. Yes. To do with the ego. Yes. Wow. And so for some reason, they agreed to let me do it. Ya Rabbi This unique celebration of sainthood, of the true mountains of the Muslim world, presents a critical alternative to the distorted image of Islam today. This is the true picture of Islam. This is a counter to all this extremist position, which is nothing to do with the true world of Islam. This is peace because these people are peace itself. Yes. They don't talk about peace. They, they, they are, they're it. living it. Just yes. to sit in their company, you feel peaceful all your concerns disappear. That's true Islam. So the book is really their pictures and then what happened when I met them. Um, this, this project has, uh, it was explained to you, is a, it's, it's, in some ways it's a contradiction. It, it's, a, it's a book about a very special group of people who do not want to be photographed and who do not want to be written about. They prefer to remain hidden and for some reason 
I made it my mission to document them. Um, and I'll introduce some of the stories to you. Before I do that, when we, when we launched the book in, in uh, Bradford and Habib Ali, Jifri came to assist with the launch, he, he said a very interesting thing that evening. He said that if, when you're looking at the faces of the saints and sages, if you reflect upon them, a narration, will, a, a narrative will begin to take place between you and God. And I think this is a very, is a very deep insight how we should relate to them. And of course, they are not bringing attention to themselves. They are, in fact, signposts to God. I dedicated the book to the next generation of peacemakers because they're the ones that will inherit the kind of mess we're leaving behind. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, his constant prayer was, O oh Allah, I ask you for your love and, and the love of whoever loves you and the love of deeds that will bring me closer to your love. There's an ayat in the Quran which says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountains as pegs? And this analogy of mountains and these people is, is becomes very obvious. If, if you think about a mountain, you just see the certain part of it, but there's much, much more hidden beneath the surface of the earth. So they really are pegs that hold down the earth. And uh, I met uh, a mountaineer, Mustafa Salama, he, his story is very interesting. He had a dream where he was standing on the highest summit calling the call to prayer. And when he woke up, he called up a friend and said, what's the highest summit? And they said, it's Mount Everest. And he'd never climbed a mountain in his life, but he learned to, to climb mountains and he climbed Mount Everest and he called the Adhan and he prayed up there. And he's since climbed the highest, the highest seven mountains around the world, what's called the Grand Slam, and he's also been to the North and South Pole. But he said to me a very interesting thing, that when he was ascending the last summit to the peak of Everest, he felt like he was with the prophets. And, uh, and so this analogy is very consistent through this uh, project. Of course, at the beginning of the book is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he really is the blueprint for these, for the saints and sages. His light, which comes from God through him, spreads out through these people. Another one of the Prophet Muhammad's constant prayers was, O oh God, put light in my heart and light in my grave, and light in my hearing and light in my sight, and light in my hair and light in my skin, and light in my flesh and light in my blood, and light in my bones and light in my nerves, and light in front of me and light behind me, and light to my right and light to my left, and light above me and light below me. O oh God, increase me in light and make light for me. And this is the mountain of the cave in which Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam withdrew from society so that he might know his creator. God said, I was a hidden treasure and I desired to be known. So I created creation so that I might be known. And this is the view from that cave of the surrounding mountains of Mecca. This is the cloak of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which was given to Uwais al-Qarani and I'm sure many of you know the story. 
But briefly, uh, Uwais Sukharani came to Medina to meet the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At that time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was traveling and Uwais Sukharani's mother was sick and he did not want to leave her too long. And so after a few days, he returned back. But when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to Medina, he sensed that there had been somebody there, somebody quite special, and he asked his companions, and they described Uwais. He then took his cloak, and he said, find him and give him my cloak. Now often when the great ones give you a piece of clothing like this, it's usually a sign of protection for you. But I think in this case, uh, that it really was a sign of his wilayat, that, that in fact he was a saint of God. Um, and I'll share with you something that was told to me that when they decided to display this cloak, because it always was contained in a small wooden box, they uh, brought four textile experts to Turkey I remember one of them was from Italy. I don't remember where the other experts were. But each one of them looked at the cloak and they said that it could not have been made by human hand. This is a true story. It happened to me sometime in the early 1970s, before, really before this project began in earnest. But once when I was in Morocco, I was with a friend in Casablanca when we noticed a very distinguished gentleman wearing a golden turban. He was tall and upright, and uh, I felt something, there was something very special about him. I thought maybe he was one of the righteous people. But we didn't speak. The next day in Marrakesh, some 150 miles away, we noticed the same man. But this time he came and spoke to us. He told us the story of a man who came to Marrakesh seeking to discover the number of saints living in the city. The man went to the local grocers to buy some sugar and tea. The vendor behind the counter said, you can put me on your list. The man was startled because he had said nothing of his project to the vendor. Later that day, he was at the butcher's purchasing some meat. And again, without the man speaking of his project, the vendor behind the counter said to him, you can put me on your list. At that point, the man gave up his search because he knew then that the seeker and the sought were one, not separate, and that the one is the source of all things. Within every country, within every city, town and village, there are saints, some known, many unknown. Some are so unknown that if you were to expose them as a saint, they would pack up and move somewhere completely different. Their role is to be completely hidden. Another true story. This is the passport photo of Sidi Mohammed Habib. In London, in 1970, a young photographic printer by the name of John was given this passport photograph and asked to make a copy of it. As he worked in his small dark room with its eerie red light, this hauntingly beautiful face, swathed in white, his head wrapped in a dark turban, slowly began to appear on the white photographic paper through the developing chemicals. Unhappy with this print, he left the photo in the developing tray over the weekend. When he returned on Monday morning, the print had turned gold. During the following weeks, John's life took a different direction. This was a path that would reach deep into his past and his future, bringing him into the present. He had become a Muslim. At that time, John was my photographic printer and close friend, and we began to talk. As I made that journey up those long stairs to then meet Sidi Mohammed Habib for the first time, I was not prepared for this meeting. I had been to India, I had recently returned. I had met gurus and saints, but I was not prepared for this meeting. 
People referred to him as Insano Kamo, the perfect man. When I entered that room, I could feel the peace and serenity. It was palpable. And I saw him as you see him in the photograph. After being introduced to him, he said something very interesting. He said, now you have two imams or two guides, Jesus and Muhammad. Peace be your blessings on both of them. He didn't separate what I came from. He brought, the, brought it together. There's great wisdom in this. He used to say, the whole world is a hospital and the saints and sages are the nurses and the doctors. In his D1, it says, for if a person truly knew the worth of his heart, he would give all he had without hesitation. And if a person came to know the bliss within his soul, he would shed a tear of joy with every breath he took. His seal with which he signed his letters read, it is the will of God. There is no strength but through God. His entire character was a reflection of these two great truths. He looked at all creation with immense compassion. He was outer peace, inner peace, and peace itself. During his life, Sidi Mohammed Bil Koshi used to serve Sidi Mohammed Habib. He used to sleep outside his door at night, ready to serve him if the Sheikh should need anything. But when his Sheikh died, he left Meknes and buried himself deep down in the desert and hid himself away. After a few years, and it seemed no one had taken on his mantle, I once went, went with a delegation to confirm the belief that he had inherited the mantle of Sidi Mohammed Habib, and we were hoping to take instruction from him. His reply was not what we expected. He said, I'm not a sheikh, I'm not a fakir, I'm not a deputy sheikh. He exclaimed, I am nothing, leave me alone. His reply secretly confirmed to me of his high station. This passport photograph was the only photograph of him that existed. He never let anybody take a picture of him, not because he thought photography was forbidden, but he didn't want there to be anything that made him appear as if he was something. He was, his humility was such. It was, I never met anyone like it. In 2007, I returned to visit Sidi Mombil Kushi. He was now 102 years old and quite frail, but I still secretly hoped to get the long-awaited photograph of him. At a time when the ego is everything, meeting someone completely free of this phenomenon is like a miracle, and I wanted to document it. After flying to Marrakesh, we made the long 11-hour drive through the Atlas Mountains to arrive at Izawiya. I met his two sons and asked them, you know, I really want to photograph your father. They laughed. They said, you know, if you ask him, he'll say no. I said, thank you for that. Um, we sat in the Zawiya, and it was not till later that evening that uh, Sidi Mambil Kushi came down. After greeting him, he began, we began to sing the Diwan, and I was sitting there thinking, I still don't have permission to photograph him. There was a Moroccan in our group, and he looked at me and he said, just take the Sheikh's picture. I was saying, no, that's not the permission I need. I want it, I want it from the Sheikh. But the evening carried on, and it didn't look like I was going to get the permission. But as I watched him, it didn't look like he was just sitting there scrutinizing us. He was in a very exalted state. And whenever I took courage, I lifted my camera and I took a picture. I just didn't want to upset the sheikh, but it seemed he was oblivious of it. And maybe the whole evening, I took four or five pictures in total. And they're not the greatest of pictures, but I think you can see who he was. Years after 
Sidi Mohammed Habib died, we continued to visit the Zawiya. Uh, and always we would find Sidi Ali there, ready to serve us. And I learned of his story. He used to be a lumberjack. And one day he was, he was in an accident and a tree fell across his face and he went into a coma. And while he was in the coma, Sidi Mohammed Habib appeared to him and taught him his weird. When he recovered, he was blind. And Sidi Mohammed Bokoshi told him, you need to look after the Zawiya. And so he was there. Whenever we went there, he was there calling the Adhan, reciting the weird, making the tea, bringing us food. Despite his blindness, he was there to serve us. And we'd be sitting with him, eating the food, and he would look at us, and he learned a few words of English, and he would say, eat a lot, sleep a lot, wake up shwir. And people would laugh, like, oh, Sidi Ali, he learned some English. Some years later, I was sitting in there in the Zawiya, just with Sheikh Hamza and I, and Sidi Ali again said, eat a lot, sleep a lot, wake up shwir. And Sheikh Hamza looked at me and said, you know, he's talking to you. That's your medicine. See, these people have insight. Some people need to eat more. Some people need to eat less. Some people need to sleep more. Some people need to sleep less. And some people need to do more. And some people need to do less. So he was telling me what my medicine is. Because I'm somebody that struggles with eating a lot and sleeping a lot. And I want to wake up a lot. <laughs> I used to, sometimes I would come to him and say, you know, I want to come and see you tomorrow. Where will you be? He said, if I'm not in the Zawi, I'll be out in the street begging. There's no social security in Morocco. These people live on whatever people give them. But that's not their main concern. They don't worry about this thing. Anyway, one time I, w I came there and saw him and I said, you know, I want to go to the Juma tomorrow and I don't know where the Friday mosque is. Will you take me? He laughed. And he said, okay, come, and, come tomorrow morning, I'll take you. So I turned up at the Zawiya. He's dressed, as you see him, in his very th threadbare robes and I was dressed in my posh Western clothes. And he took my hand and he led me through the Medina and we must have looked quite a pair together. And uh, we got to the mosque and he said, leave me here. And I went in and I prayed the Juma. When I came out, I saw him standing in the same place and he was standing always as he is when he's standing in the street with his hands like this, as if he was praying. I thought to myself, he's working, like he's earning some provision. I don't want to interrupt him. So I went quietly over, I didn't say anything, and I put some coins in his hand, and I went back to the Zawiya. Half an hour later, he came back. He said to me, where were you? I said, oh, I saw you were working. So I left you and came back. He said, I wasn't working, I was waiting for you. See, I made a presumption, which was a wrong presumption. See, I often have this thought comes in my mind quite regularly now. Contrary to what you think. See, we make a lot of assumptions about what's happening in life. This person did that. This thing happened to me. That shouldn't have happened. That's not what's happening. God is working with us all the time. I made an assumption it was wrong. His job was to take me to the mosque and his job was to bring me back. His job was just to serve me. As the years passed, despite his continued poverty, Sidi Ali became more dignified, even stately in his demeanor. I was devastated when I received the news of his passing at the beginning of 2017. He has left a space in my life and my trips to Morocco would not be the same without him. You know, from the very early years of going to Morocco, I never ever saw the wives of the sheikh. If they spoke to us, it was from behind the door. And so I never knew what they looked like. Obviously, over the years, they got to know us. And then I would see a little bit of them. They'd kind of peer out from the, by the door and they'd ask, how's city so-and-so? Kushila best, ask all about your family, ask about all the fukara. 
As the book was kind of gaining momentum, I realized there were very few women in there. And I really wanted there to be women in this book. But the culture of Islam does not really allow very often to photograph women, particularly saintly women. And we've asked the Shayuk, where are the women? They say, the men are hard to find, the women are even harder to find. But Habib Ali Jifri said one thing at that moment. He said it's half and a half, half women and half men. Anyway, we have a friend, Harun and I, a good friend of ours, he's a musician. He's a musician from the 60s. He became a Muslim, and uh, he's never met any of these people, and we're always talking to him about them. And he said to us, before I die, because he's had a lot of heart problems, he nearly died on the operating theater table once, and uh, they brought him back to life. He's had been in and out of hospital with heart problems. But he said, before I die, I want to meet some of the saints of God. So we organized a trip for him, very careful trip, like just three days, not too uh, strenuous. And uh, he was about to go back into hospital for another, yet another operation. So we went to the Zawiya, that was the first place we would go. As we entered the Zawiya, we saw Leila Zuleika sitting by the tomb of her deceased husband. She called Hamza over and said to him, I've been waiting for you. I've seen you seven times before. And then she leaned over and put her hand on his heart and started praying for him. We could not believe what was happening. They've never met before. Some of our group were crying. It was just such an incredible moment. And I thought to myself, he's having the pre-op before he goes back for the proper operation. She said to him, it will get worse and then it will get better. So when I finished the book, I wanted to show him the picture and everything. And uh, he said to me, you didn't tell the story that I'm getting better. I said, well, when I wrote the book, you were getting worse. <laughs> but he said, you know, I'm losing weight, I'm swimming every day. So at this present time, he's getting better. Inshallah, Allah give him a long life. And she was not dressed like this. She was dressed very modestly. And when I said, can I do your picture? She went up and she put these beautiful clothes on and she sat before me. And none of us knew. Nine weeks later, she would pass away. And she's buried next to her husband in the Zawiya. You have to read this story. I don't have a lot of time. Yeah, this is a great story. Though. This was a man who was a drunkard who lived in a brothel and he ended up being the chauffeur for the sheikh and driving him around. It's a great story. Muli Abdus Salam, I saw this fakir when I entered the Zawiya once, leaning up against a pillar. He was clutching his stomach, obviously in intense pain. And he was saying over and over again, Alhamdulillah, Allah kuli hal. Alhamdulillah, Allah kuli hal. Alhamdulillah, Allah kuli hal. Praise be to God in every state. And these people see illness as a purification. You know, when we, us mortals get sick, we rush to the doctor or we rush to the pill cabinet and down some pills. We just want to get better as soon as possible. But they know there's wisdom in the illness and they just accept it with forbearance. I once asked the blind wali of Bahlil, if you get sick, what should you do? Ask God or have patience? He said, have patience until your patience runs out and then ask God. <laughs> Sheikh Mohan Rabbat al-Hajj. Sheikh Hamza showed me quite some time ago a very bad, in the days of video, he showed me a very bad video of Sheikh Mohan Rabbat al-Hajj and said, I want you to come and photograph my Sheikh. I took one look at the bad video and said, I'm coming. We flew to Mauritania and it was a 24 hour car journey to get to Twemeret. And uh, there I arrived in this incredible place with just a few tents, a couple of mud buildings, a lot of camels and camels and mountains and desert. 
and a lot of students wandering around with wooden boards reciting whatever they're learning. And uh, I was introduced to visit, uh, to meet the sheikh. And I was introduced to him, they, they told him my name. Now the only way I can describe this transaction is that when they told him my name, he asked again. Now if it was a CIA, they'd go on their mainframe computer and they would uh, kind of check out you out and probably come up with a lot of facts that are not true. But uh, Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj was quiet and then he said, and he went somewhere far more exalted and far more truthful. And then he said, Nam, Nam. And he raised his hands and he made a long prayer for me. And that was the end of the transaction for me. I do not speak Arabic. I couldn't sit and discuss finer points of fiqh with him or Quran and everything. That was, that was it. And he gave me everything. He made a long dua for me and that was it. And then the rest of the time I just spent observing him because you learn a lot just by watching these people, how they spend their days, how they hold themselves. And this is a man of incredible presence and very few words. And you'll see him doing what he did every day, sitting with his students, correcting them if they made a mistake or expanding on it. And if he wasn't doing this, he would be praying. If he wasn't praying, he slept two hours a night and he only ever drank camel's milk. And it was a very difficult photograph to do. Because it seemed such an imposition on what he just did on a daily day to basis. But you know, he had never been photographed before and I felt it was important to, to document this because once he was gone, that, that picture would be gone and now he has disappeared. Lamu. I got told about the island of Lamu in 1970s by a Dutch painter. He wasn't a Muslim, but he told me, I've just been to paradise on earth. Of course, I was very curious, where's that? He said, Lamu Island. There are no cars on the island. And on every Friday, all the men wear white when they go to the mosque. So I was curious. Some 25 years later, I went to Lamu. There'd been some progress. There now was one car on the island and one road. And the road, the car belonged to the district commissioner and the road went from his house to his office. <laughs> Everybody else walked or used donkeys and mules. And there, and so every, every the month of Maulid, they have big celebrations on the island and they have Dao boat races and Quran competitions and the men do processions to go and visit the great saint Habib Saleh who's buried on the island. And there I met Sheikh Rocket. So Sheikh Rocket's story is very interesting. In the 60s, he was a Catholic missionary and he had a dream and he was told, you're a Muslim, your name is Musa Ali and you should keep company with the people who love God. And every year he attends the Hajj and every year he attends the Maulid in Lamu. But he doesn't have a passport and he doesn't have any money. So they say to him, how do you get there? And he says, by Rocket. <laughs> Hence he's called Sheikh Rocket. And I've since learned there's a handful of people who don't have passports, but they turn up at the border of Saudi Arabia and they're given something to wear and they're allowed to perform the Hajj. I love this story because this is somebody who escaped my camera. When I performed the Hajj in 1971, I met a dramatic figure at the Kaaba. He was a Sudanese man and he had the most incredible dark ginger ringlet hair, ringlets of hair, and he was draped in a green robe similar to this one, which trimmed with red around the sleeves and red around the bottom. And he had two possessions. One of them was a very large wooden prayer beads, and the other one was a really beautiful can for, doing, for performing wudu, for washing before the prayer. And it's one of the most beautiful cans I've ever seen. I've never seen one like it in my travels around the world because I always wanted to get one like it. It was beautifully made. It was of steel and it was trimmed with uh, bronze. And uh, these were his two possessions. Anyway, I was struck by him and I said, uh, if I come to Sudan, where can I find you? And he said, ask for me under the date palm in Omdurman. 
Okay. So I took note of that, and it was always in my memory. Of course, it was some years when I finally went to Sudan, and I went to Omdurman to look for him. And everyone I met, I said, do you know Sheikh Uthman? He lives under the date palm. And people shook their heads in amusement. And everyone I asked, and they must have been thinking, who's this crazy English guy? So it looks like I wasn't going to find him. And then someone told me there's a Sheikh called Sheikh Asaim. He fasts every day of the year except the two Eids. Um, but he, I went to his Zawi. I thought, well, maybe I can meet him. And I went there and they told me, no, he's traveling. But come and sit, we'll have some tea, we can talk. And I was sitting there in their Zawiya and I heard outside the door someone singing the Shahada very loudly and in walked Sheikh Uthman and sat right down in front of me. I was shocked. He raised his hands and started to pray. He prayed for all the prophets all the saints and all the sages, all the Sahaba, all the Imams, everybody in the history of Islam, he prayed for them. It seemed to last 10 or 15 minutes. And then he got up and said, Salaam Alaikum, and he left. And that whole time I never thought for once to pick up my camera and take his picture, because I was so shocked to see him. Habib bin Mashul Haddad, one of the hardest ones to write about. Some of these people are so incredible and have such a big effect on your life, and it's very difficult to write about them. I had asked Dr. Omar, who are the key people in Jeddah? He told me three people, Habib Akbar Shula Haddad, Habib Abdul Qadir Sukaf, and my own Sheikh is Dr. Muhammad Abu Bakr. But he said, my Sheikh probably won't let me let you photograph him. Okay. I went and met Habib Ahmed, and of course, I, as soon as I met him, this man was so full of love and mercy and compassion and empathy, I fell in love with him immediately. And I was just, whenever I had spare time, I used to go and visit him. He used to travel around Africa where there was really a very... Um, There was cannibalism. I mean, they were, these were very difficult tribes. But they, he would present Islam, it must have been in such a simple way that they just whole tribes accepted Islam. They say that something like 120,000 people accepted Islam from his hands. This was him just a few weeks before he passed away. This Habib was 106 years old. I was taken to visit him. He ran around like a man of 25 years old, serving us with food and drinks. He told me that he would live to 100, 100, until the age of 111. I never any, ever heard of anybody predicting their, their death before. But some years later I went back and his name was brought up by a young man I was talking to and he said, oh yeah, he just died recently. And I worked it backwards. Yes, he was 111. I know I've been told five minutes, but I need 10 minutes, sorry. <laughs> um, this story is great. This is uh, Dr. Omar's sheikh at the time, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abu Bakr. We arrived, and, and Mohammed, uh, Dr. Omar said he probably won't let you take, he never let anybody photograph him before. So we arrived at the non anonymous accommodation of Sheikh Mohammed. We greeted the sheikh and had some polite exchanges before broaching the possibility of photographing him. He quickly declined, but invited us for lunch as compensation. During the lunch, I could tell he was mulling over my request. He said, what would be the purpose of the photograph, he asked. I explained my project, that by photographing the great spiritual masters, I was hoping to present people with a true picture of Islam, and added that I was sure that my colleague, Dr. Omar, would love to have some photos of his beloved teacher, as he'd never been photographed before. Still, Nothing was agreed, and we carried on eating. See, it's one of my secret weapons is that when you ask these people something, they do not like to say no. Anyway, after the meal, he looked me straight in the eye and he said, you can take my picture if I can give you something. I said, Sheikh, I went on two accounts, not one. He said, you can take my picture. 
if I can give you something, I want to give you my weird. I said, Bismillah. He gave me the weird and he went and got ready for the photograph. And then I really saw who he was, a man of incredible presence. I sent some pictures to him a few weeks later to, just to check he was happy with the picture. I got a message back. He likes the picture, but he wants you to come and do another one, this time holding his sword. <laughs> There's no time to go this, but you need... Uh, they just the, I tell you the fact that they discovered the house of Seda Khadija in the 1990s. And uh, it's probably one of the most important finds historically. And when I photographed it, there was three days before the bulldozers came in. But as it is, the, the, the Hatchie house, they told me later that it's covered with sacred earth. It's underneath the, the marble there, as, as it was discovered. And uh, anyway, their reasons for not leaving it are their own. But uh, for me, it, it really shows the reality of how small the house was that both he, him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his beloved wife lived in. Very small. For years, I asked them to let me go up the minaret by the side of the Green Dome. Of course, they always had reasons to not let me go up there. I wanted to put the Green Dome at the center of the picture, not always as a small thing at the back of the big complex. One of their greatest excuses was they'd lost the keys. But I'm very persistent. I ask them every year for five years until they run out of excuses. So they said, you can go up, but you mustn't take any pictures of the Green Dome. And I remember thinking, what do they think I'm going to photograph? <laughs> the air conditioning? <laughs> the loudspeakers? I said, yeah, that's fine. And did it, and did it anyway. Of course, you know this is the, the space where you greet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I heard that there was someone that was allowed behind this space to uh, keep it clean. And then I heard that he, was being, he would be in a house near where I lived, 20 minutes away. Grabbed my cameras and went to meet him. I entered another very anonymous looking house and there I met Sheikh Muhammad Iqbal Abbasi Qadri Ahmadani. He told me, for 23 years I was the doorkeeper of the Prophet's mosque at Baba Sadiq. He said, then I had the honor of cleaning inside the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad for 10 years, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after which the authorities stopped this practice. As he sat before me, a man of very incredible presence, he was 105 years old when I took these pictures and he died at the age of 125. I met him regularly in Medina and in England. And towards later on in his life, he was sick in his bed and I thought I'd take the opportunity to ask him what's actually inside there because I didn't, had no idea, I'd never seen any pictures. So I asked him and he said, light. I thought he misunderstood me, so I asked him again. Light, he said. Three times I asked him, each time he said light. But he said, if you have darkness in your heart, you will never see it. You have to read this story. There's no time to tell this. But this, is, this was Dr. Abdullah Khadi's teacher. And he kept on saying to me, you need to come and photograph him. But they do not allow to photograph the sheikh, the shaykh of uh, Eastern province. And the story how we got the picture is a miracle beyond miracles. I have to tell you this, there's two stories I have to tell, I have to tell you this one. This one is called The One Who Danced and Laughed for God, Hassan Alawi Sharif al Ahdal. I met this man at the, at the, uh, the howl of uh, Habib Omar Sumait in the Comoros Islands. And I love this guy, he's always laughing, he's always dancing, he was just the most happiest person I ever, ever met. I got him by himself and I said, you need to tell me your story. He said, I had a dream, and in a dream I saw somebody from behind, and they were throwing their stick up in the air. And he kept on throwing the stick up, and then he threw it so high, it got caught up in the minaret. So I ran up the minaret and got the stick, and brought it down and presented it to him. And when I presented it to him, I saw it was Habib Omar Sumait. But Habib Omar Sumait said, My food is, your food is not with me, it's with Habib Ahmed Mashur. 
So I went and found Habib Ahmed Mashur, and I used to attend all his gatherings. And I used to love the food there. And then Habib Ahmed said to me, it's not physical food you need, it's, my, it's spiritual food. He said, then I began to serve the Sheikh and look after him. So I asked him, how come you're, so, how come you're always so happy? He said, I learned some time ago not to fight with life or battle with other people, but to accept that everything is from God. And that's why he's always smiling. I went to Syria with Habib Ali, and uh, Habib Ali said, I have to come with you because they'll never let you photograph them. And uh, he, he told me on the way to visit Sheikh Abu Hassan Muhyiddin Khurdi that he looks like the Sahaba. I remember asking myself, how does Habib Ali know what the Sahaba look like? And he also told me that the Sheikh does not like, has never been photographed. After the difficult discussion, the Sheikh looked at me and said, don't ask. Like, if you ask, I have to say no, just do it. So I did it before he changed his mind. And now I just want to finish with one last story. And you'll understand when I explain it. The book was finished. As far as I was concerned, there was no one else ready to go in the book. It was complete. And two years ago, I, I, I made a presentation of this. And after the presentation, this very sprightly 82-year-old woman came to me and she was beaming full of light. And I remember thinking, she's really at home with all these people. They're like her extended family. We started to talk and she began to tell me a little bit of her story and I said to my wife, we need to go and visit her, I need to photograph her and there's room for one more. And I was really happy it was a woman. I went to her house and she told me the story. As a young girl, whenever she got sick, she would retire to her bed. And she'd be laying in bed and she'd see her deceased grandmother sitting in a chair by the side of her. And she would know that everything was all right. And she would go back to sleep and she would recover. And this happened several times during her childhood. When she was at university, she met a Pakistani man and the man said to her, I want to marry you. She said, I'll marry you, but I'm not changing my religion. Of course, eventually she became a Muslim. But her husband died quite young, and after his death, she decided to go and perform the Hajj. But before she did the Hajj, she got sick, and she was in bed, laying in bed. But this time, instead of her grandmother, she saw a gentleman sitting there, very illuminous, and she just, again, she felt everything's okay. She went back to sleep, and she recovered. She didn't know who the man was. A week or so later, she went to a bookshop. It was a, a Muslim bookshop she'd never been to before, and she went in the, the store and she saw this book on a bookshelf. She said to the man, who's, who's that man on the book? He was in my room the other night. He said, that's Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad. They said to her, when you go and do Hajj, you should go and visit him in Jeddah. So she did the Hajj, and she always loved the word mashallah. So when she was in Mecca, she bought a necklace which had the word mashallah on it and she put it on and tucked it inside her dress. She went to Jeddah and she went to the house of Habib Ahmed. When she entered the room and saw Habib coming towards her, he said, mashallah. During the course of the meeting, he gave her a, a set of prayer beads and he said to her, don't let it go hungry. So now in her sprightly age of 82. She goes to charity shops and she buys necklaces and she makes sets of prayer beads out of them and she gives them to people and she says to people, don't let it go hungry. And he was her sheikh until his passing in 95. Then let your thoughts range free before the mountains and you will find them without doubt to be the pegs of the earth. They are among us, though we may not see them. And if we can learn, as these mountains have, the science of purifying our souls, we can bring back into the world unimaginable balance, beauty, and serenity. It is my sincere prayer that we do. And I just want to add one thing. You may have ever heard of the, the snow leopard principle. You know, there are these people that sit up in the mountains in Pakistan, 
hoping to see the snow leopard. They sit for days and days just hoping to get a glimpse of this animal. The snow leopard principle is that beautiful things don't ask for attention. In essence, beauty attracts attention, but true beauty does not, doesn't seek it out. And that's what I think these mountains are. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Jazakallah khair, Sidi Abdul Azim Sanders, who, uh, mashallah, this has been an amazing night, um, but um, we want to continue. Good things need to be continued. If I can ask uh, Sidi Arun to come to the stage, inshallah. We'll have time for uh, a few questions and answer from the audience, uh, but I want to be um, a little bit selfish and ask a question that's been on my mind since the beginning of the night. How did the two of you met? <laughs> a long time ago. <clears throat> there we go. We met in, uh, yeah. actually we met in Berkeley yes. in 1972. Uh, that's the time that I entered Islam and, and Abdul Adim had been a Muslim for a year or two. And uh, we, there was a, a group from, uh, of uh, followers of Sheikh Mohammed bin Habib who were gathering in Berkeley. I think it was either in Milvia Street or Channing Way. I can't remember which one. Of, and uh, I came up, uh, the co I was living in, in L.A. and I, I came up the coast. I heard about the group and became a Muslim at that time. So that's how we met. <laughs> That's amazing how we're meeting back in Berkeley. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Subhanallah, yeah. destiny is amazing. Yeah. But uh, first of all, thank you for that beautiful presentation, both of you. At uh, um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm levitating right now, sitting <laughs> next to you guys. <laughs> May Allah bless you. And uh, to make this a reality, and for us to have it in our home. Um, I have the book, the copy of it, and it's, um, it, it's a blessing to have it and go through it with the family and friends and, and those who visit the, the home. Um, many of those stories that wasn't mentioned, honestly, you, you got to read those stories. Uh, in, in the book, obviously, Sidi Harun's book, it, it, these are story, not stories just to be read, but also to be really reflected upon, especially with, with our children and, and the next generation to come. So uh, we'll open for the questions and answer from the audience. Um, Insha'Allah, if anybody has any questions, you can, uh, is there a mic, Sidi Harun, or? Yes, there is a Q&A mic. If anyone has a question, okay, it's just Q &A step mic forward right to the left, here, front the, left. So you can just go and uh, ask your questions, Insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa Jazakum Allah khair for taking the time to come this evening and share your work with us and also for doing the work all these years. Um, I have a very general question for both of you, inshallah. It uh, might be difficult to answer, but anything you could provide would be helpful. When sitting with such people in life, how did you get them to feel comfortable with you, sometimes on your first meeting with them? How did you get them to feel comfortable with you enough to show who they were to you, either by telling their story or by sitting there and letting them, or, and letting you take their photograph. How, how does that work? Hmm. Um, t to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> They're very generous for a start. Um, and one thing I, I kind of have been thinking about, because you know it's very much the selfie generation where young people are having, photographing themselves in all these different places, this is me in this place, this is me eating this thing. And I, I've sort of thought about it a lot. What, why, you know, why do people do this? And I think they're trying to find an identity. But the thing about these people is that they know who they are. When they sit in front of you, they don't bring any mask to the, to the presence. They are who they are because they've 
know who they are. You know, this thing, he who knows himself knows his Lord. They know who they are, and therefore they've learnt who their creator is. And so it's just a matter of me really just being myself with them and just sitting with them and then, of course, getting their permission because I can't... There's no stealing pictures from these people. You need a permission, otherwise the picture is not a proper picture with presence in it. And uh, it's not easy. You know, some of these are quite frail. Some of them are over a hundred. And some of them, I didn't want, you know, I only had a few minutes to do the pictures. But I've always felt that I wanted to do it because I've had the good fortune to meet them. And I wanted to share this with other people. And um, I can't really say more than that. I don't know, you want to add something? Well, I would say, from, from having uh, watched uh, Abdaldim and, and traveled with him and so on, that his, his priority is actually seeking knowledge from these people. And in order to do that, you have to have a, a adab, you have to have the right kind of approach and the right courtesy and the right uh, um, sense of being in order to be in their presence and I think this is what allows him to to capture these people there are, there are two very great photographers uh, that we, we know who have done books that have uh, approached dervishes and, and, and saintly people but they don't capture this because they're basically photographers. They're, they're almost like ethnographers. They, they, their photography is very beautiful, but they haven't gotten to that kind of intimacy because that's the priority, really. And uh, so I think that that, that is what's allowed this to, book to, to materialize. And, yeah. Any other questions? Good. No questions? So we can go to the... Yes, Mike is right there. Sure. <laughs> what was the most easier first step you think that we could benefit in pursuing a, a sincere relationship with Allah and a, and a direct one, kind of like some of these people seem to experience? What's a little thing we could do as a first step? I, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What's a, what's a small, or like something that you saw across all their lives, the one thing that was a common denominator that they could, people can do who pursue a direct or, or more um, relationship with Allah? What's something that you saw in all of them that kind of was a common denominator? Something that they can do in order to get closer to Allah, something oh, okay. the basic. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say the, 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 begin, the, the sort of the beginning point is need. You, you have to be in, in, in need. One of our teachers in Morocco, he, he used to say that Allah, there is nothing Allah loves more than his servant uh, with his hands outstretched and tears in his eyes asking Allah. And it's that feeling of helplessness which is the key to really beginning on a path. You have to get to that point. And uh, so I think that's, that would be one beginning that, that you, you need to have. People have asked me, how, how should you approach uh, a sheikh or, a, or a, a, a one of the awliya? And I, my answer is, be needy, feel needy. If you come, and you don't need anything and you're very happy with yourself and everything, you're not gonna get the same thing than if, you, if you're feeling almost desperate, you know. Um, one of the awliya said that if you knew the value of distress, you would only ask Allah to give you distress because this is what makes the heart. And, and this is one of the reasons that I wrote the book on, on Tauba, because Tauba is the thing that engages your heart. You suddenly, in your heart, you, you're, you're ter in, in turmoil and you feel remorse and you feel, and this is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. 
uh, we don't like to feel that, these things. We want to feel great about ourselves and everything, but really that's the beginning, I think. Uh, I'd like to add that um, we were fortunate enough to have one of these people in my house just before I left, and my son asked him a very practical question about, you know, how, how can I draw closer to God? And I loved his answer, because, you know, often you think Shayuk are going to say to you, you need to do 10,000 lay lay la la or some, some huge. And the Sheikh said to him, just get up two minutes before do, dawn and recite 10 lay lay la la Muhammad Rasulullah. And then just before you go to sleep, do the same thing. And I was sitting there thinking, that's amazing. Because he's making it so easy. And of course, after a while, 10 is not enough, right? You need to do 50. And then after a while, you need to get up half an hour before dawn. And this is how the path, you know, if he'd said to him, do 10,000, he'd never do it. But just do a little small. And another one of my teachers said, if there was a wooden barrel, a, wo a wooden water barrel, and I said to you, could you fill that barrel by putting one drop of water in it every day? You say, that's impossible. But sure enough, if you keep putting a drop in every day, eventually that barrel is overflowing with water. And that's what we have to remember, that a small amount done every day consistently accumulates into a big thing, and that's what it's about. It's about being consistent. And, uh, you know, there's a thing about, that I've noticed about all these people is that they always pray on time. Whatever happening, they pray. That's one of their top priorities. They said about Sheikh Marabat al Hajj, the remaining weeks before he passed away, he kept saying, is it time to pray, is it time to pray? That's their priority. And then, you know, uh, their humility, you know, they're the most humble of people. When you come to them, there's zero judgment. They're not sitting there and judge. They may have seeing, but it's coated in compassion and mercy. And they see you at a certain point in your spiritual journey, and then they make prayers for you. If they see their obstacles coming, they will pray for them to be lifted. And that's the transaction. It, it, you know, they always say it's easy, and I say it's easy for them to say it's easy. But that's the encouragement they give us. Wow. Any other question? We're going to take. Uh, okay, if anybody else is standing, then we're going to take these. Or you have? Do you have a question too? Okay, can you stand behind her so we can? And then, so this is the last three questions, inshallah, and we'll close tonight. Go ahead. Okay, salam alaikum. Thank you so much for the book reading and the presentation. Our family has been enjoying your books for a number of years now, and you're preserving our history. And this is just a wonderful gift, and we're very grateful to you. My question was, is are there any mountains you haven't been able to photograph yet who you wish you were able to include in your book who are living right now? Oh. No, I just, uh, I just wish there'd be more women in it, really. It's just, because it kind of looks like it's a kind of male-dominated world. But as, as Habib Ali said, it's half and half. Half women, half men. You know, when I went to the, the Maulid in Lamu, the great-granddaughter of Habib Sali, Who's, who I said is buried on the, on, the, on the island, she was still alive. After the Maulid, all the scholars and all the shayuk went and greeted her. They kissed her hand. And I wish I could have photographed that, the, the respect and adab they had for her. And this was really, uh, you know, uh, she was incredible and very exalted woman, really. And, you know, the world needs to see them. But there's some wisdom why they are hidden at this time. Maybe it's the way women are treated in this society. Allahu alim. But they do exist. They're hidden. You just have to find them. Assalamu alaikum. Actually, my question um, kind of piggybacks off of your response because um, actually when I was reading um, Signs on the Horizon, I what stood out to me and what impacted me in that book particularly, um, m m all of the stories did, but particularly your stories when you were talking about your interactions with your sheikhs, your teachers, um, and um, your experiences, losing them and finding them. And I came out of reading that book 
thinking, here I am, a Muslim woman with a young child who's often at home and wondering, how do I find my guide? Where, where are the women and where are they? And how do I find them? And how do I, and it doesn't, and, and not particularly does it, it, it has to be a woman, but how do I find as a woman um, and a seeker, someone who would yep. help me on this path. Um, and when I read your second book, um, Heart's Turn, some of the stories started to show me that finding those people as a woman, it, it, it's possible and that you can do that. But I still, how do you, where are they? How do I find them? Because I mean, one thing that came to mind when I was reading was I was thinking as a as a as a mom, um, is my kid my sheikh? Because she certainly feels like it sometimes, and um, she lets me know what what are the worst parts of me and um, and you know what I need to work on. And so I'm like, okay, I could take I could take my my little daughter as as my sheikha. But um, she's not gentle, and you know <laughs> that's. But um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm just. Where's the where? Where are the guides for us? Well, I, I th first of all, Allah is the guide, yeah. and Allah is present. Yeah. And this is one of the, we're living in a society where God generally is described as an absence. But we know as Muslims that God is, is a presence, is present. He's closer to us than a, our jugular vein. So the first thing is to, is to ask Allah. Uh, and there's a dua that you can say, and the shuyuk give this dua. Allahumma dulani ala min ya dulani alayk. Allahumma, Allah guide me to the one who can guide me to you. Mm -hmm. And you ask that from, from your heart. And inshallah, you'll find someone. Um, I asked uh, Sifudul al-Hawari a long time ago, how do I find a sheikh? And he was actually, uh, he had the idhan to be a sheikh. He couldn't do it. He, he just, he, he, it was too, too much for him. He said, it's impossible. That was his, the way he looked at it. He said, so make the sharia your sheikh. Mm. So you fo follow the sharia, Pray from your heart, and there are the there are people that you can. And I think if you read the book, mm -hmm. there are there are people that you can connect to, and um, so d don't give up hope. And you need a sheikh. I, I used to visit Sheikh uh, Abdul Qadir Isa, who was a wonderful Syrian sheikh from the Alu Alawi from the Alawiya. And he, every time I went to visit him, he said, Haroon, you need a sheikh. You need to have a living sheikh. He never once said he was my sheikh. He, or he, he, never, he never said, no, you need to follow me. And I didn't have a connection with him somehow. So these things happen organically. And I think if, if but remember that Allah is present. Allah, when you ask Allah, it means he's listening, you know. Uh, we, we anthropomorphize uh, God. We turn God into a person who's mm -hmm. limited. God has no limitations. Mm -hmm. So when you're asking him, he's present. And remember that and ask Allah to uh, you know, help you, yeah. guide you to the one who can guide you to him. And you, inshallah, you, you, you will find someone. And and uh, take heart. And there are people who, after the this gathering, we can maybe talk a little bit about that if you want. I'd just like to add. It's a very small thing, but there's a line in the D1 of Sidi Mom and Habib. It says, "If your heart is sincere, you will see them without traveling." Mm -hmm. And that's true, really. If if you can travel, they'll come to you, in dreams or in visions or in physical. It's possible. Anything's possible. You just have to be awake. Make sure you don't miss them. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> they sometimes are very anonymous. Sometimes they're very anonymous. MashaAllah. Uh, Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi said that which you're seeking is seeking you. So inshallah, life is a field of dream. If you build it, they will come. 
um, last. That was the 1980s movies right. reference. So all of you guys just aged yourself. We laughed. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. So forgive me ahead of time if this is crass, but I didn't know any other way to phrase it. How do you know you're in the presence of someone who's a real deal? That's uh, California lingo. So. No, no, I'm, 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 I, I get it completely. Yeah, okay. I, Just since you're um, in Berkeley, I don't have to translate. You were here no, before. No, no, I so. mean the real 1960s, deal. 1960s, yeah. nothing has changed. Yeah, so absolutely. Saying, yeah. um, it's a good question. Um, it's actually something we're working, we're work, I'm working with a collaborator on a book about these kinds of questions um, right now. But um, the first thing is that you have, to, the, whoever it is that you're, that you're uh, approaching has to rigorously follow the Sharia. If someone is violating the Sharia, the, the, uh, stay away, you know, go f find somebody else. It's, uh, and this is very important, especially in these kinds of environments in, in America and the West where there isn't a traditional uh, matrix of, you know, uh, knowledge. So th that's one thing. The other thing uh, that, that characterizes everyone that I've ever met and that Abladim has ever met, they're incredibly humble, incredibly humble. And they're, they're not necessarily charismatic. You, you love them. When you get to know them, you fall in love with them. But they aren't, you know, they, they don't have a spark necessarily or anything. They can be completely, like Sidi Muhammad Bukhorshi was like air. And no, people would come into the room and they wouldn't rec he'd be, he'd recognize them. Uh, uh, Muli Hashim Belghiti, one, a, couple, a year or so ago, some girls came to Morocco to see him, and they went to a gathering that he was supposed to be in, and a friend of ours saw them afterwards, and they said, did you see him? And they said, no, no, we're so disappointed. He wasn't there, there was another sheikh, he was talking, and he wasn't there, and anyway, we didn't see him. So then, you know, as people do, someone had taken a, a video, you know, uh, on their phone of the gathering, and it was panning across, and the, my friend was with the girls, and he said, no, 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 he was there, you see? See, that's, that's him. And they burst into tears, because he was the one that was serving them tea and asking them if they were okay, and they didn't recognize him. And that can happen, because they're really humble. Uh, so, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, one of my teachers said that when you're sitting in front of the great ones, your nafs is being chopped up into a thousand pieces. So if that's happening, you'll feel it. <laughs> uh, it. If you feel different, something is happening. If you don't have a connection with them, there's no connection. One of the, we asked one of the shayuk, you know, how do you tell who's a real shayuk? He said, you can have the best iPhone in the world, but if you don't have a SIM card, you're not connected. I thought I love that mythal. Yeah, okay. uh, actually, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Qadir Isa, he said to me once, uh, in, in the same light, he said, he who is connected to the one who is connected is connected. Wow. And he who is connected to the one who is not connected is not connected, <laughs> which is a very concise way of putting it, I thought. 